coming up, I saw the stool there. I wasn't sure if Ed put it there for me or what. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to all of you here today in the fellowship hall and those viewing the service later on. This week, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about the song, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We need to rejoice in every day, but lately with the warm weather and the beautiful sunshine, I've been especially grateful, especially this time of year. It's kind of unheard of around here to have such beautiful weather, so we need to be thankful every day. I've also thought about human communication. It's not perfect. There's always a risk that someone will misinterpret our words or misunderstand our actions. The results may be damaging or hurtful. When speaking with someone and they don't really seem to be listening or responding to you, you might right, right away feel that they're not listening or care what you have to say. In reality, there may be some underlying issues they are dealing with, but we jump to conclusions and make judgments. Put yourself in their place. What were they feeling? Why did they react that way? How would I have felt? What could I have said? in that situation. First, we need to understand and put ourselves in the other person's place. If you do, it's quite certain that both your understanding and compassion will take place. The Bible states that true wisdom is considering our words and caring for the person or people who are listening. Can my words hurt or offend others? Will my words draw others toward me and my faith in Jesus? Or will my comments push them away? Speaking with wisdom and grace goes a long way in bringing unity instead of division. Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come together as a church family to worship you. Be with each one here today. Help us to reach out to others. Let us be a source of joy and encouragement to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. We now have singing with the worship team. <coughs> Father, indeed, we are blessed to uh, join together today and to stand before you and be together as a body of your people and to just raise up a joyful noise unto you, just recognize your holiness, your goodness, your love, your might, and uh, be in your presence in this day, in this way together. And uh, just pray that each one of us will be filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, as we leave today to just shine for your love, the world around. Amen. Please stand if you care to. The first two songs are actually from the hymnal. Uh, the first one is the uh, light blue, the second one is the dark blue, if you want to look at the hymnal. Thank you. 
We often focus on the physical hurts and pain we experience and our calls to God to fix these health challenges. However, we may also have emotional and spiritual heart and mind needs. It's important to recognize that healing may come to us in many ways. God and Jesus may provide us the strength we need to overcome physical hurts or give us the gentle and humble words to speak in mending a broken relationship. Or they may bring just the right person into our lives to brighten days of grief and loneliness. These are all examples of their healing ways. We may expect healing to come in a traditional medical manner, but God doesn't always work in the ordinary. We must learn to be open to the extraordinary ways of being made new again. A broken bone may be painful, but it might bring a needed pause for us to open our eyes to God, wanting to work healing in other areas of our lives. To verbally tell God, like David did, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a spirit within me, a willingness to be totally dependent on his healing. Let's pray. Jesus, as we now bring attention to our dependence on your healing, help each of us to welcome your strength, your comfort, and your wisdom as we meet the challenges of each day. Help us also to recognize that we may be part of your plan to bring healing in the life of another person. Thank you for working in your extraordinary ways. Amen. Thank you, Tina. We come to a time of announcements. Um, one thing is Geneva would like some help after church um, to move some things from the sewing circle room up toward the back door because Tuesday, I think she said Tuesday, they will, someone will be taking the sewing circle stuff that we've done over the weeks um, to Pennsylvania. And there's a lot of boxes and it's, some of them are pretty heavy, so we would like some to meet out back here to, to remove some of those boxes. Thank you. Um, and it's down here for the Children's Church, but there will be none this morning because Paula is not feeling well. Okay. Um, in the bulletin, you can, you can look for yourselves. You all should have a bulletin of the things coming up um, next week or whenever. Um, be sure and look that over so you, so you know. And this week, um, the um, opportunity, giving the opportunity to share. We have supplies up here in this next week three is toothpaste or body wash. So we'll continue with that. And thank you for those who have brought things. Okay. Um, let's see. We go to uh, oh, Janet Beck also asked me, she has some extra rejoice. If anyone would like one, see her after church. Okay, we go to a time of prayer and praise. We'd like continued prayer for our requested for Jerry and Janet Rudy's daughter, Christine, as she will have surgery on March 22nd for cancer. They won't know the follow-up plan until after the surgery, so we need to remember her and the family. Um, continued prayer requested for Jonathan and Lena Neuschwander and their baby that was born prematurely this week. Both the baby and Lena are, de are dealing with ongoing medical challenges We've been praying for them, and we will continue to do that and just pray that everything will, will work out with God's help. Um, we want to remember um, the Angie Robbins family as she passed away on Thursday morning. The funeral will be Wednesday morning at St. Stephen's. And Angie attended here for a while, 
and she's been ill for quite a while and now she has passed so we need to remember that family and also the family of Betty Rawson who passed away and I believe that would that was from Vernon I think that was um, uh, a son and son-in-law's mother um, I want to make sure I have everyone here. We also would like to remember Peter and Loretta who are serving uh, with MDS. Um, be with them and all those others that are serving along with them. Um, they're not here now, but we need to remember them and the work that they do also. Okay? So, we go to prayer, please. Thank you, Lord, for each one here today. Help us to love and care for others as you care for us. We lift each of the requests offered here and pray for each one. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for Christine. We pray for J Jonathan and Alina and the baby and for all of those who are, are ill. We just pray that your hand would be upon them, that you would bless and care for them and help them, Lord, to feel your presence with them. We pray also for the families of Angie Robbins and Betty Rousam as they have lost a loved one. Please be with them and comfort them as they go through each day. We also pray that you would help each one to feel your presence with them, caring for them. And we pray for those with unspoken needs. You know who they are and what the need is. Help us to look to you and know that you are always with us, loving and caring for us. We are never alone. Our hope and faith is in, with, in you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um, there's no children's church, so we go to the offering, please. us so much. Thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you have given us. May this offering bless others in need. Bless the gift and the giver. Amen. And we now have special music with Kathy Woodrick and Romy Nasher, followed by Ed's message. And I just have to say I'm glad to see the accordion here, Kathy. I always love it because my sister played the accordion, and every time I hear her, I think of Carol. Thank you. We got 
charity to help us this morning too. So <laughs> this is a familiar song, I think, for many of you, called "He Touched Me," and it's about how we are all healed by the hand of Christ. Thank you very much for sharing. Well, good morning and welcome. And thank you for being a part of this 
Sunday here in March. And I don't know if March came in like a lion or if it didn't. And with leap year and, and everything, I don't know if that changes it or not. Uh, February 29th, which could have been a March 1st, was a very cold and windy day. So maybe that was the lion. I don't know that, that for sure. But I can guarantee you this, that March is going to go out with a lamb this year. It's absolutely going to go out with a lamb this year. And I know that because it's not a prediction. It's no folklore. But it is actually the promise of what happened being fulfilled. Because March 31st is Easter. And it's the day that we celebrate the fulfilling part of Jesus' life when he was the Lamb of God and he was sacrificed for each of us. So whatever the weather may be, I don't know. But I do know this, it's going to go out like a lamb, with the lamb. As we talk each week about being totally dependent this year, being our theme, we're talking about what Jesus and God have done for us, obviously, and what we are dependent on each, each and every day. And on March 31st, the, I'm going to give a little spoiler alert here. That Sunday, the message is going to be totally dependent on his resurrection, because it is Easter Sunday. So along the way, though, we're think, learning about all the different ways that we are dependent on Jesus and God. And you already heard from Tina this morning. Thank you, Tina, for sharing some of the expressions of kind of leading into this week's theme, being totally dependent on his healing. I'd like to begin with a question for you. And here is the question. Do we miss God's healing because we put our own limits on what needs to be fixed? Do we miss God's healing because we put our own limits on what we feel needs to be fixed? As Tina had shared, a lot of times we give focus to our physical hurts in our life, and those things are kind of evident to us and the pains that we might have. And I'm sure each of us along the way have had pains and hurts and those things that just don't seem to go away. And we give a lot of focus to those things and we wonder when are those gonna go away? But at the same time that those may be lingering on, there may be some other miraculous things happening in our life that we don't pay attention to. You know, we live in a time of phenomenal medical advancement. You heard this morning about Jonathan and Elena, our nephew and niece, and the miracle, <coughs> miracle of birth of a premature baby that 75, 50 years ago would not have happened and even been considered to be possible. But it is amazing what advancements have been done in the area of medical technology. But at the same time, companies are definitely trying to benefit from that by putting out all kinds of things that you can purchase now medically to help to take care of things. And whether you're on social media or television or radio, you don't have to listen long or look long. And there is so many advertisements for medications. You can get medications now that will take care of all the skin problems that you might have. Diabetic needs, digestive issues. We won't talk about what kind. We'll talk about the things that are advertised for mental health needs and all the medications that can help to benefit you in those ways. There is absolutely just about a pill for anything. And about a month ago, one of our grandsons came home off the bus and he was singing one of the jingles to one of the medication songs that he had obviously heard on TV or YouTube or something. <clears throat> and he was just singing along and saying he just needed that one little pill because it was gonna lower his a A1C, <laughs> that little pill known as Jardians. And so he was singing that tune and dancing off the bus as he and his friends were singing that. But that's just an example of how inundated we are with all this medicine that is just going to take care of everything in our life and all the ailments that we have. And we expect immediate physical responses and changes to take place because there's so many medications that will help to do that. And we expect that that's the way it's gonna happen in our lives, that just immediate results are gonna happen. And what we do then sometimes is that we will wrap God up in those treatment plans. We wrap him up along with the medications that we're going to be taking and expecting that he's going to heal us based on the medications and all the directions and all those things. But I think we have to be careful 
that we don't put limits on how God heals us. Because his healing may not be given on the side of a medication bottle and how many pills you're supposed to take. You know, for example, physical challenges in our life may not be healing the way that we want them to be healed, but God might be developing in our lives a renewed emotional and mental strength that we may not have had for some time. You know, sometimes we forget about those kinds of things, that we get focused on the physical and we forget that God might be taking care of something else in our life that needs to be fixed. You know, I've observed this kind of thing throughout my life and throughout my career and working with so many different people that might be battling a lot of different kind of physical ailments. And they get so focused on those, they become incredible disturbances. And that just takes all of their attention and all of their energy. And at the same time, there may be something really incredible taking place mentally and emotionally in their life that they might not necessarily be seeing because they're so focused on the, the physical needs. But there are some wonderful ways that people become determined and optimistic that has nothing to do with the physical healing. And I've observed that so many times. That sometimes people that are going through something extremely challenging, all of a sudden this other area becomes so prominent in their, their lives that they become an example for other people. That's God's healing. That's God's healing may not be what we expect and how we expect it to happen, but that is God's healing if we allow ourselves to see it. You know, someone who may have appeared weak in their life, someone who may have appeared weak might be able to capture a newfound confidence simply by going through a challenging time. That's healing. That's healing. A newfound confidence at a time of weakness is a healing that can definitely be something that we can give God credit for. He also heals relationships. We don't oftentimes think about that. But like Tina had read in the opening reading this morning, somebody coming to you or to me or us being a voice to somebody else may be the relational healing that needs to be coming into their life. And God may give us or somebody else the voice and the words to say that they can bring that. We don't oftentimes give God the credit for that kind of healing, but that is, that's healing. I'm going to go to a familiar story in the Bible, John chapter 9. And I forgot my glasses back in my coat, so I've got Cheryl's. <laughs> I, think they'll, I think they'll work just fine. This is about a guy that was born blind. And it's a story that we hear about oftentimes and we learn about in Bible school or Sunday school or when we're little kids. I'm going to read the verses to you beginning in verse 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi or teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, sin, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must go do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went, washed, and came back seeing his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like the man. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. Now, that could just be taken at face value and just be a nice story about a blind man who could see. But there's so much more in this story than just physical sight. 
and physical healing. I'm sure that that man was extremely elated that he could see that he, things that he could never see before. I'm sure he was excited about that. But he did more. And there was more about this story than just simply seeing. He became a voice for what God had done. He became a physical voice for what Jesus had done for him. He had been seen as simply that blind man that sat along the road, that begged for money because he didn't, couldn't work. He was the man that people would walk over, walk beside, talk about, put down. That was this man. And Jesus healed his sight. But there's no doubt in my mind that he had more than just his sight healed. I had to believe that there was this new sense of life about him. This new sense of confidence, physical, emotional, mental, and I have to believe spiritual as well. You know, later it says that he was taken to the religious leaders, those are the people of the church, and they're basically questioning him, and they're trying to intimidate him and insult him and all these things because they're asking, how did you get your sight back? Well, they didn't want to believe what he was saying. And then he says this in verse 27 to 30. I think this is kind of unique how he said this. They asked him, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already. You didn't listen to me. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. So, this man, who couldn't see, all of a sudden gets a voice. And instead of just sitting along the road begging for money, and calling out and saying, I can't see, I need money, he becomes a voice for what Jesus did. He had this newfound confidence. He was healed in a in a way that he probably never anticipated to be healed. And this is where I think it's kind of cool. He was bold because he speaks back to the religious leaders and said, why do you ask me this? Do you want to become one of his disciples too? Well, he was kind of flippant about it and they didn't like that. And so then they throw him out of the town and basically you're on your own now, fella. But I have to believe that this man's confidence that he had now because of the strength that Jesus gave him didn't disappear. In fact, it says then that Jesus went and found him and basically was looking to him and saying, you know, how are you doing? You know, what's going on? What are these people saying? I'm kind of adding into the story here a little bit. And this man says, I believe. I believe in you, Jesus, because what you did for me. This man's healing brought a purpose to his life. Instead of just sitting along the road begging for money, this man now had a purpose. He'd been healed that he could see, but he also had a voice now that he had never had. He had a newfound purpose to go and tell others what had been done for him. So here's a question for you as well. When we desire healing, and each of us at some point is going to desire healing, do we do it with a purpose in mind? Do we desire healing so that something can happen, that I can have a purpose in my life, something that I can do. I have to be honest. When I want strength from God, it's usually not so I can do something necessarily for Him. I'm being honest about that. Usually I'll say, I want to be able to do this so that I can have strength to go and climb a mountain, go on a hunting trip or go on a traveling trip or whatever it may be, cut some wood, whatever is ahead of me that day. That's what I might be praying for. That's the strength that I'm asking God for. But do I ever just simply say, I want strength, I want to be healed so that I have a purpose. So that I have a purpose to do something more. To do more of His work. God's work. I have to be honest, I don't think I usually pray like that. I usually just pray, I want, to, I want this strength, I want this to be changed. And I'm sure we've all prayed for healing. But do I ever just say, I want this so that I can do more? 
likely we don't do that too often. Here's a couple other questions for you. Do we get frustrated when the healing doesn't come to us like we expect it to come? Or do we get frustrated when the healing doesn't come as quickly as we hope that it would come? Do we get frustrated because it's on God's time and not my time? Do we get frustrated when somebody else with the same kind of problem gets healed and I don't? Those are the kind of things that, if we're honest, those are real kinds of frustrations. But here's another question that goes along with it. Do I actively seek healing? Do I actively seek the healing or do I just pray God change it in my life? Do I go out of my way to reach out and try to help myself to be healed in a new way? I'm going to tell you another story here, taken out of Mark chapter 5. This is about a lady, a lady that had been sick for a long time, and she had exhausted resources, and this is what she did. A large crowd followed Jesus and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffer, suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all the resources money that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she was getting worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see, the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the truth, that she was the one that had touched him. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. It says, so after exhausting all the medical possibilities that were out there at the time, which would have been nothing like all the medications that are available today, she exhausted everything possible. She didn't have any more resources because she'd spent it all. She finally decided, I'm going to do something on my own. She literally took it into her own hands to reach out to Jesus. Now, the part of the story that is important for us to think about here is this. She was a woman, strike one. She was also suffering from an ailment that made her unclean, which means that people would never want to touch her, never want to be near her for fear of being unclean themselves. Another strike against her. Plus, she was in a crowd of people that were crowding around this man that she just wanted to touch. And she was afraid. All of those things were in her. She was a woman. She was unclean, according to the customs of the time. She was in a crowd. She was afraid. But she took it upon herself to reach out and say, I'm going to try to help myself by simply reaching out to Jesus. And Jesus stopped and said, wait a minute, somebody touched me. He recognized that somebody had touched him. And then he could have dismissed her. He could have, because of the religious traditions, he could have said, you're a woman, you're unclean, somebody take her, get her away from me. But that's not how Jesus heals. He calmed her fears. That's another word for saying healed her. He calmed her fears. He healed her. He said, go. Go in peace. No more suffering. You're freed from that. You see, he did so much more than just healing her physical needs, which were terrible, I'm guessing, that they were absolutely, after 12 years, just debilitating. He gave her an emotional healing as well. He gave her a new sense of who she was. He gave her a comfort and a peace that nobody else was able to give her. Comfort and peace, that's healing. Sometimes we don't like to think about this, but sometimes at the end of life, when somebody passes, somebody that may have been dealing with something for a long time, 
That's healing. That's comfort. That's peace. Again, we have to be careful not to put God's healing into this confined or defined box. Here in 2024, we have kind of this idea of what healing should look like. And sometimes we put God in that same kind of healing box. And we can't do that. We have to be open to him healing other parts of our lives. Something that may be a, a nagging kind of thing that goes on in our life that may not get better. May be always present. We can't let that be a distraction from other areas in our life that are getting stronger. Now one thing that we have to also recognize is that when there's healing that takes place, oftentimes there's a scar that remains. And sometimes people get really focused on those scars. Whether it's an emotional, physical, or mental scar, whatever it may be. Sometimes people really get honed in and, and just get so super hyper-focused on those scars. And they see them only as a reminder of a painful moment in their life. But I would like to suggest that we can also look at the scars as being a reminder that healing took place. Because a scar really says that something has healed where there once was a wound. And instead of looking at it as a reminder that that was a bad moment, we can look at it as a time, God did heal me. It may look a little different, it may feel a little bit different, I may go into life the next day a little bit different, but God healed me. I would like to suggest that this is what it means to be totally dependent on his healing. I'd like to read, a, just a, in closing, a few words from a, an old hymn. It says this, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely in thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Totally dependent on his healing. Will we?
just, as we go into this week, we have to be cautious that we don't put God in a box when we're asking him to heal, that we have to be open to many ways of healing to take place. Next Sunday, Susie Rice will be bringing the message, and it'll be totally dependent on his love. So we invite everyone back for that as well, and into this week. Let's pray. God, we're just so very grateful that you do bring healing. You heal us emotionally, physically, mentally, and most importantly, you heal us spiritually. Help us to actively reach out and touch you. Help us to be open to seeing that healing can take place in wonderful and new ways. God, I just pray that you help us to be your voice to others. Help us to be a voice of passion and compassion that might bring healing to someone else. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Mighty baptizer, son of